Hi to everyone. Today, there's a great surprise for my all my top audience. Our special guest, none other than Dr. Roland Roberts. He's joining from all the way from New York. He's a one of the very famous candidates from the Republican Party who's running for the next year presidential election. How are you doing, Dr. Roberts? I'm well, thank you. Great to be with you. Thanks. Dr. Roberts, if I have not mistaken, this is the very first time in Sri Lanka a USA presidential candidate who's joining with us on board. It's a great pleasure for us and to our country. First, let me ask this from you. Why do you want to become the president of America? Yeah, it's a great question. And ultimately, I'm running because America has lost her way. Uh, we are in a bad way on nearly every front, economically, national security, uh, the family unit and structure. But most of all, uh, I want America to do right by her citizens, and I want America to do right by other countries and other the people, uh, people groups of other nations. And we have lost our way. And I believe that it, when we treat people right, and you do right by other people in other countries, we can enjoy greater peace and greater prosperity. Uh, and it elevates mankind around the world. Good, the prophets that always you mention. God, family, and country. So as a candidate, how are you going to put these three things together and govern the country? Yeah, you know, some of the people who have never voted Republican before, in fact, they've been staunchly other parties, have really gotten behind my candidacy uh, because they have come to the place where Policy cannot solve the problems. Policy alone cannot solve the problems we face. And they recognize that they can keep fighting for the changes that they want to see, but they will fight until eternity and not things not be the way they desire until God is recognized in America once again. So that's why we say we need the help and blessing of an almighty God on America in order to have a good way forward. Now, uh, I can tell you that how that relates to the economy is everything, because you can put in great policy, but if it's not blessed, and there's a principle that says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So when you recognize him, you can attain his blessing, and we need his blessing economically. We have record high inflation. We have families that can't afford to put food on their table. We have an uh, Im immigration system that is flawed and completely broken. And so we need uh, our national debt to be eliminated, not just reduced, not just the, the deficit or the bu budget balanced. We need our debt eliminated. And so we need a major fix in the economy. National security. We have to uh, have immigration reform. We have to have uh, uh, advance our military capabilities significantly. It has been uh, dramatically weakened through frivolous wars uh, and through uh, bad policy. And, and so that, though, that combination has made us extremely vulnerable and unable to defend ourselves uh, as per the Constitution to the fullest degree. And then the family unit. Here's, here's the net net. You can have the strongest military in the world, but the strength of a nation is equal to the strength of the family. So if you celebrate marriage and family, all the other marginalized or vulnerable people groups, actually their level and standard of living raises and rises as marriage and family is celebrated and promoted and, and grows. However, when you mock and destroy the family unit and you uh, celebrate the disintegration of the nuclear family, then all of the other groups fight for, to be seen. They fight for relevance and you can't have it both ways. You have to celebrate family and marriage and that actually allows for all of the other uh, forms of lifestyles uh, to, to survive and flourish. So that's why I say America needs God, and that's how it fits in with the economy, national security, and family. Yes, you have mentioned that for the economy, you need the blessings of God. Okay, if I'm not mistaken, 
that uh, 31.46 trillion is the national debt at the moment in America. Is he blessing America at the moment? Is is uh, is America what? I'm sorry. As you said, you need the support of God, the blessing of God to develop the American economy. So if I'm not mistaken, the American national debt is 31.46 trillion right now. So at the moment, you think yes. is God is blessing America or is he a little bit thinking about America? <laughs> that is a great question. And no, I do not think uh, that his blessing is on us whatsoever. Uh, I think he is merciful to us uh, for not consuming us because of the atrocities and the evils that we have perpetrated against our own citizens and against countries and citizens of other nations. I think it is, uh, the, the, we have been a very corrupt nation. Uh, we talk a great game. We talk nobility and honor and but much of our administrative state, uh, we sometimes refer to it as our deep state uh, in America, around the world has been very anti-American in how we conduct ourselves. And, and so, no, I do not think his blessing is upon us. I think his mercy is having mercy on us. But, uh, you know, one of the ways that we want to fix the economy, to your point, I expect to be walking in as president to a $35 trillion deficit. I fully expect that uh, over the next year and a half. And so I have to focus on how do I pay off $35 trillion? And the truth of the matter is, there's there's not going to be all payoffs. Uh, we're not just pay, uh, paying off all of the debt and walking away. A lot of it, we should not have incurred to begin with. A lot of it, we have been duped, and it was alliances that we really formed. We might have only owed $2 trillion, but we would go in debt for $5 trillion so that some other things could be done, some other funny business. So uh, it, look, we owe one trillion to China. Uh, we owe uh, our largest debtor, twelve plus trillion, is is to Japan, uh, and you know several of those uh, neat numbers need to be dramatically reworked, uh, and then we will settle, uh, like you do any debt uh, or, or most debts. But uh, I, I can tell you that my methods for doing that will be twofold. Number one, uh, we will freeze, and I can do this as the president, uh, as in, through executive order, freeze the uh, rehiring of all non-critical government positions. Uh, just by freezing the rehires of non-critical positions will reduce the federal government, the size of the federal government by 20% during my first term alone. Uh, I don't have to, I don't need Congress to cut spending. I don't need Congress to change uh, and, and get you know, 400 people to vote a specific way. Uh, we are able to do that in the executive branch and government will run better. It will run leaner, more efficient. And uh, so I think that that's the first major element. The second major element, and this is the same thing you do personally. If you're trying to get ahead financially, personally, you have to cut expenses and increase your income. Those are the, those are the two things you want to do. Uh, and the more you can do of both, uh, the better. And so uh, the, on the income generation side, we must become not only energy independent, which is kind of the popular buzzwords now, but energy dominant. We have more oil in the United States than all of the Middle East, than all of Russia, and several other countries combined. So why in the world would we ever buy one barrel of oil from anywhere else, unless we can get it cheaper than we can manufacture it and drill it ourselves. But I can tell you, that's not the case. We can have $1 per gallon gasoline. That's uh, it, not a stretch uh, to do that, which grows dr GDP dramatically. We got to get out of the 1%, 1.1% growth and, and get more into that three and a, three and a half, four, four and a half percent uh, growth rate uh, on our GDP. But when you focus on on real energy dominance, then you must develop nuclear energy, which nuclear energy is what we use for our, our largest projects. We fill up our submarines one time in the life of, of the vessel, one time. And yet our, my vehicle, we have to keep going and filling it up with fuel every day, every few days. That's, that's nonsense. That's silly. It's because we're using, uh, uh, it's because of the, the systems that are in place, uh, profit systems and companies and corporations 
uh, that kind of keep want that profit to keep coming in. They're not interested in what's best for you in your life. They're interested in their 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 greed and their profit. Okay, uh, you're a businessman at the same time, government advisor and a peace ambassador. At the moment, now you're in a candidate for the next presidential election. So, Dr. Roberts, why do you believe in entrepreneurship highly? Yes, I believe that entrepreneurship is the single greatest economic engine on earth. I believe it levels the playing field. You know, in America, and especially in American politics, there's so much division, hateful rhetoric, and it's unnecessary. But it's the only way that certain very incompetent candidates could ever rise uh, because the, the people out uh, – way and there's a majority of of common people than there are of elite so the only way the elite can keep their grip on people uh is by is by uh controlling them uh and so how i'm approaching uh entrepreneurship eliminates that you're no longer dependent upon the government to to feed you you're no longer dependent upon a corporation uh, to provide for you. And then if you don't, they threaten with you with firing you, yanking the carpet out from under you. And now you and your family go without. And, and so there's a lot of people that cannot afford to take their opinion to work with them. <laughs> they would be fired if they spoke their truth, spoke what is uh, they believe or what their viewpoints are. They would be fired. Uh, we saw during the pandemic that uh, corporations have more power than governments. The government in the United States, even though they had, uh, they could not mandate the vaccines to the fullest extent that they wanted to, many of them. So they used corporations to mandate vaccines when they would say, you have to get the vaccine or you're going to be fired. And, st and so they actually started choosing. Can you imagine when they come and say, you must have this medical procedure done or you're fired? You must, uh, and they already tell you intrude in your personal life. They tell you who you can and can't sleep with, right? You can't sleep with colleagues or your clients or, you know, they have parameters. They have a dress code. Uh, they have, you can't wear what you want and look the way you want because in their mind, you're representing their brand, right? So, but entrepreneurship is, is the highest form of freedom, uh, individual freedom, uh, economic freedom, and that is what countries, if you want to grow your GDP, it's what China recognized uh, two, a couple decades ago and really started promoting entrepreneurship. It's what Spain did when they brought me over in 2016 to, you know, as part of the top 20 startup companies in the world and advising them uh, there. Uh, a lot of countries rec are recognized, even Russia, you know, that was had communist schools during the Soviet area era especially transitioned in the late 80s, uh, in mid 80s, mid to late 80s, to start teaching economics uh, and entrepreneurship and, and business ownership. And the reason it was because they knew they must have that in order for their economy to flourish. So I greatly believe in it, both for nations to grow and for people and families to grow. Wow. Dr. Roberts, that as the main person of the Transform Africa project, would you like to share some details with us about that? Sure. Yeah, I'm very passionate about helping people. And I can tell you with through our mission uh, work in, with Transform Africa across the entire continent, uh, we, have, we have been helping for years. Uh, we primarily through clean water initiatives and technology, advanced technology. It's more advanced than what we use in the United States. In fact, our demo machines uh, in Lexington, Kentucky, people can come and they can see the water go through the machines. And we just use the tap water, our city water here in the United States, running it through, and you would not want to drink it. Uh, it purifies it so much. And so we're able to deploy our water technology across Africa, uh, and it gets to the people who need it most. Uh, it's extremely economical, which is usually the the hardest part of any type of a clean water initiative and it's uh, is that it's economical and that it's scalable. Uh, it's duplicatable. A lot of times something works in one place, it won't work in another place. You have to test the water of the borehole and see what the contaminants are to see what the filtration can, can uh, eliminate. We don't have to deal with any of those things uh, because of the technology. So it's been a 
huge. We've actually leapfrogged uh, most of the water technology in the world, municipal water uh, technology in the world for at the continent of Africa, uh, because partly it's the switching costs are very expensive for people who've sunk, you know, a billion dollars, 500 million to a billion dollars into water treatment plants for massive cities. Uh, it's it's hard for them to just switch to another project, even if instead of a billion, it's only 80 million. Uh, so uh, that's what we have helped Africa with. Our education, uh, you know, I believe, once again, entrepreneurship is the key to liberation and leveling the playing field because it doesn't matter what your education level is. It doesn't matter who your parents were. It doesn't matter if you were born into money or born into extreme poverty. If you have an, a God-given dream, an idea, and a vision, and we can help you uh, pull that out of you and that creativity, you can grow and flourish and prosper uh, like never before. And that's the human way. Uh, and I believe that uh, we've, so we teach that through a rolling college there in Africa uh, and our school of entrepreneurship, our school of literacy, that came from a, the former president of Malawi. Uh, Malawi's uh, literacy rate was 69% uh, illiterate and mostly female. And so that was really keeping them suppressed and economically and with opportunities. And so before we taught a lot of other things, we said one of the greatest things to help people grow economically is if they learn to read and write. If they become literate, it expands their world in so many ways. So we developed our School of Literacy. It's the fastest literacy course. It literally people can learn English at, at a high school level, uh, starting at four or five years old, all the way up to people. We've had people in their 70s. Uh, in, in early 80s that have taken the, gone through the School of Literacy uh, and in three to six months, they're writing and, and reading at a high school level. So it's a great course. Uh, we make it uh, complimentary for people in Africa uh, to be able to, to, to take that. And we've actually subsidized almost every one of our African students uh, on the continent, actually, um, through, through our uh, schools. And so I greatly believe in the work that we're doing there with education and clean water. And then, of course, in South Sudan, you know, and uh, the world's newest nation. And the U.S. gave birth to, to South Sudan 11 years ago. And uh, they've had a rough go. They've had a couple civil wars. And uh, but, you know, democracy uh, is messy. Freedom is messy, really. Uh, and so uh, there's birthing pains that they've gone through. And the rest of the world, you know, we expect them to act like us after but we've had 200 and nearly 250 years of practice at being a free people and people who for generationally have been fighting uh and warring and your, your average life expectancy for a male is 27 28 years old you're bred to die and if you're if you're still living past the age of 30 it's almost a disgrace because you haven't fought hard enough for your tribe this is the mentality and so to break that generational paradigm of thinking into a free man way of thinking uh, takes time. I mean, think about how hard it is for you or I to change our mind about something. And we have advanced critical thinking skills. So it's uh, been a difficult journey, but uh, I can tell you the improvements from three years ago when I first stepped foot in South Sudan to today uh, is is night and day. The roads are more developed. The infrastructure is more developed. The utilities are more stable. Uh, it is safer. Uh, there is more commerce. Uh, they There is more dignity uh, in terms of even the clothing uh, and being covered. Uh, it, it's amazing to see the progress of what happens with a free people. As you mentioned, the freedom is mercy. What's your policy about the black people in America? Well, I can tell you, we, we, we're grateful to have uh, immigrant the support of immigrants. Um, in fact, they're calling me the immigrants president, um, their, their choice of candidate. And part of it is because I think I understand the plight because from, from working in Africa uh, so much, but also we have people uh, that we've been divided racially so long that there's a, there's a group of people who just want to improve. We want to have better families. We want to have more opportunity for our children. And we realize we actually have shared goals. We're not the ones who divide ourselves. We are being divided, but we're not the ones doing the dividing. 
when we're at stores, I mean, they open the door for me. I open the door for them. We don't see color. You know, so many times we were taught for years, don't see color. You see the person, you see the character, see the heart of somebody. And then you realize we're all the same everywhere in the world. We're humans. Um, so where did this narrative of see me for my color? I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't put in an order for God and say, now, God, I, I really want to have this color baby uh, whenever they come. And I want to be this. When you when I'm born, I want to be this, this, and this. None of us chose it. So what the best we can do is respect each other. And so the Black Caucus uh, in the United States that is for Roland Roberts for president, I'm grateful because they see past the things that the other the powers that be that want to maintain their grip of power they see how bad it is to divide us on such silly things now i will say in the same breath it is not it is not right to to uh marginalize uh or to um uh discriminate against someone based on their skin color i don't want to be discriminated because i'm white and i would never discriminate because someone is a different color you know, and, and let me tell you this. I believe that I came because I came from the corporate world. In the corporate world, it is illegal. It is illegal to discriminate on all of the things that in politics they celebrate the discrimination. They discriminate on race, they discriminate on sex, they discriminate on gender, they discriminate on faith, and they celebrate that. Uh, even even our president, you know, had announced uh, that he was going to uh, nominate. A female vice president. Uh, and a lot of times they'll say, I'm going to have a female, or I'm going to have a male, or I'm going to have a black lady or a black man, or this this race or that gender. And look, that's com everything they're doing there is completely illegal if you run a company in America. It's illegal. So why is it okay on this hand and it's illegal on the other hand? It's a double standard and it's not right on that on that front. So in business, I learned. I've had people of, of that are transgender. I had people that were homosexual. I've had people that were you know, obviously every color, every race, every religion, every background imaginable. And we all work together every single day for years towards a common goal. And none of those issues ever came between us because we're friends, because we got to know each other, the real us. So uh, can we have a united America once again? Yes, under God, we can. But I do believe that that's the only banner under which Americans can unite ever again, because the division is so great. We will never unite on anything high enough, a big enough, unless it is God. Okay, Dr. Robert, that we'll get back to your policies that you have explained about all your domestic policies, defense policies, fiscal policies, economic policies. Okay, everything is fine. Uh, let us know what is your domestic priority. Domestic priority is the economy. Uh, our inflation is is off the charts. Our national debt is under control, is out of control. And you know, our founding fathers said, and this is good governance for any nation on earth. But they said when they formed America, they said there's three things that will destroy America that you've got to viciously uh, defend uh, and watch. Uh, and uh, the national debt was one. Foreign alliances was two, and the, the or, or, or actually there was three and two. And then the number one thing they said you've got to watch for is the national debt. Uh, you do not want to be beholden uh, to other nations uh, because that will destroy your currency, and then you have no society. And as you see today, the de-dollarization is rapidly expanding. Uh, BRICS obviously coming out with their own currency. Uh, the digitization of currency, uh, the central bank. CBDCs uh, coming out with their own currencies, China coming out with their own version, uh, their own crypto. Uh, I'm telling you, there is so much flux. And I'll say, I will say, in all of human history, usually when a declining world empire and the ascending world empire, there's usually about a 30-year transition. And instead, it's happening in weeks, not decades or generations. And so there is so much rapid change in the world today that no one person controls it the way it used to be. Uh, so I believe that on our domestic policy, econ economy is number one. By the way, a strong economy is one of the greatest measures that I can take 
to secure us nationally as well. Our defense, one of our best defenses is a strong dollar. We use sanctions. Uh, we've used sanctions like candy in the past. Uh, and I will say that, you know, sometimes they're warranted and, and I, and, and for sure, sometimes they are overbearing and not warranted, but I can tell you that I would rather sanctions than war. I am for peace. Uh, I will fight and defend whatever we have to in terms of our national interest and American citizens every time. But I am for peace, and I would rather use nonviolent uh, strategies uh, to achieve our ends. But you cannot do that if you have a weak dollar. You're forced to just fight because that's all you have, which is why most of the world does fight. We've been able to use some other things to try to stay out of conflicts. But uh, the de-dollarization is a huge issue. The inflation is a huge issue. And uh, so I believe, though, having a strong economy through energy development and through eliminating the debt uh, will solve these problems. And it also secures America. Dr. Roberts, as, as you mentioned, that you love peace. So are you going to be a peacemaker between Ukraine and Russia? You know, I hope to be, and I plan to be, and I've already gone, uh, taken le uh, steps that direction. Uh, I can tell you, I addressed uh, Ukraine and European leaders uh, about one week ago, and I was scheduled to be in Kiev. It was, uh, but the bombing at the Kremlin and also in Kiev City happened the day I was uh, to be en route, and so I did not continue the journey um, for safety reasons, but I have been very integral in what we believe are appropriate pre peace measures. Uh, it's like in anything, there must be, uh, both sides are so entrenched, but there is a peace, a pathway to peace. There absolutely is. And uh, I, I know that there can be, but I'll tell you my great concern and I am ashamed to say that there are people in America and people uh, in some American agencies that are anti-American uh, that are trying to rapidly create World War III. I firmly believe that the next president of the United States will be leading America in a war and having to get that war to a peaceful conclusion with as little bloodshed as possible on both sides. Uh, and, and I shouldn't even say both sides, it's going to be a multi-side uh, uh, battle. But uh, I do believe that uh, peace is possible. Uh, it is War is absolutely avoidable. And I, I do pray that we get to that end uh, sooner rather than later. Let me raise this question as a journalist from the Southeast Asian country. What is your foreign policy regarding Southeast Asian countries? Yes, so first of all, my foreign policy at a high level is just that we will protect American interests wherever they are in the world. We will do whatever we have to do to protect American interests. So now we have to back into, well, what are those American interests and at what would that mean or look like if there was a problem? Uh, I do believe in diplomacy. That's the diplomatic work that I've done in Africa with the president of South Sudan. I encouraged him with good governance. I have met with the ministers in office of the president with Ghana and with Malawi and um, Kenya uh, and a number of, of, of nations. I addressed the Chinese leaders and, and Communist Party in Beijing, China, uh, on the U.S.-China trade war in 2017. And uh, so, you know, I, I am used to going in and, and, and speaking truth in these, in these matters because I believe in diplomacy. Uh, I, I, even the Chinese, even though we vastly disagreed on the way forward, they celebrate deceit and dishonesty in business as a virtue. And in the American Western culture, we see that as a sin or as a flaw, a character flaw. Uh, well, that means that we're always going to disagree on how to do things, uh, but we can still be respectful in our dialogue one to another. And we were able to gain consensus on that. And so, um, uh, I do not want to involve America in wars not belonging to us or conflicts not belonging to us. I believe that people groups, there are, there are unique cultures on earth, and many of these have to be resolved within themselves, not through American interference. 
it's kind of like in your family, every family uh, dynamic, if you get enough, if you go out far enough, you have your family unit, mother, father, mother, children, you go out a little farther, you have in-laws, you have cousins, you go out further and you have more relatives. Families oftentimes fight and have disagreements among themselves, right? Well, that's the way it is with cultures. But it's interesting. We could be fighting each other in our family. And then someone from the outside attacks our family. And all of us immediately go, oh, uh -uh, you don't attack our family. And we go attack. That's the way I view it with many cultures and nations is when we try to interfere, we're not fixing the problem. We might think we are. Uh, we're usually exacerbating the problem. Uh, a lot of times we don't even under, fully understand the problem, as we've seen in Sudan uh, with some of the warring factions. We have our way, of our vision of how we want to see peace, but uh, it is not the kind of peace that will last for centuries. So I do agree and believe that my my foreign policy, as it relates to like Taiwan and China, for example, that's the of the most importance right now to Americans is and to the next president, because if we are in a war with China, at this point, if it if it was today, it would be over China taking uh, action against Taiwan that the America deems unacceptable. And uh, we've had a one America has had a one China policy, uh, but we also have interests in Taiwan, and so I am not a fan of fighting for other nations' independence. Um, that is something I think they need to work out between themselves. So I am not. A, do not interfere in uh, other countries' issues. I believe we should stay out of those uh, and let them resolve themselves. Uh, and the only time we involve ourselves is when American interests are at stake. We obviously live in a global world. And I mean, we have assets, property, bases, citizens spread all over the world, uh, the United States. We have to protect those. Uh, so if there are factions within a government, a rogue government or the sitting government, uh, then then we have to protect those, whatever they mean. But it does not mean, uh, in my estimation, the problem is we always either do too much or not enough. And I think it takes wisdom and discernment and good judgment, which is why it is which is why I'm running for president, because I haven't seen a candidate at all in our lineup uh, for this for 2024 president that I believe will govern with sound wisdom and good judgment and with discernment. Uh, they're too, they follow too much of party line, party thinking, you know, this whole country is bad, this whole country is good. And governments have problems, but even the governments that I have problems with or America has problems with, there are good people in those countries. The Russian government has been anti-American, but there are a lot of wonderful Russians. The Ukrainian government, we, you know, we have we have friends in all countries of the world because we are all one people. Um, so I don't view the people as America's enemies. I view certain regimes that are leading certain countries as America's enemies. Okay, Dr. Roberts, that as my final question, because we are running out of the time, I do need a very short answer. As a great believer in God, do you justify the abortions? Very short answer. A short answer. <laughs> uh, uh, that that is a, that is a tricky question. Except I will tell you, I, as a believer in Christ, my positions uh, are very uh, conservative, and I kind of hold I hold the same standards he does uh, on those lines. I believe that we're created in the image of God, so I I uh, support protecting life. And, and but I will tell you this: uh, food for thought. I want to see, you know how they have exceptions for rape and incest uh, with abortions in the most United States laws. I want to see that if you're going to include an exception for rape and incest, I want a life for a life. I want the rapist or the person who committed the incest that's going to create the abortion of the baby. I want the perpetrator, the person who caused all this pain for the mother and the child. I want them uh, eliminated as well. And I want it done within 12 months. Okay, Dr. Roland Roberts, thank you very much for joining with us. Only 532 days left to achieve your dream. We wish you all the very best from Sri Lanka, Colombo. 
So thank you very much again and again. Wish you all the very best. So we want to see you as the next president of United States of America. All the very best. I'm Pramila Veerasinghe from Colombo. Thank you for joining with us. Thank you much. Molitunen Matok.